Hello and welcome to the LNUR line, episode 10. We're going to be talking about British models of uh, locomotives built in Lego bricks today. And we have uh, Matt, our usual producer. Hello. We've got Andrew as podcast runner. Hello. We have Will. Hello. And Trace. Hey! And Miller. How's it going? And we also have uh, Henry and Amanda listening. And we have with us Sam, aka British Bricks. Hey, guys. Oh, welcome. So we're going to start with some Lego train news first. And the first bit I have is uh, news from Keybrick, and Matt's going to talk us through that one. Okay, so Keybrick 1 was actually a, originally a Kickstarter project for a replacement rechargeable battery pack for the Powered Up Hub. And unfortunately, the Kickstarter wasn't successful. I think it was a combination of very much an unknown product and not much in the way of marketing being done or marketing coming in quite late. Um, but they did release 40... Uh, in a 3D printed case uh, exclusively on their website with keybrick.one um, and one of those is actually in my possession and that will actually be going into one of the models shortly it's a drop in replacement for the bottom of the the powered up hub and it, and the battery compartment so effectively you just unplug that plug in the keybrick one and away you go effectively it does have a couple of tweaks to just being standard battery box so it does have a few separate power modes and it because of the it's a rechargeable battery box and the way it's been done it actually has a reasonably standardized output throughout the uh, battery charge level so even up to say the single digits of percent it is still uh, giving quite a good level of power okay thanks matt we are move on to uh, will next who's got some free instructions for us yes uh, at my alter ego block junction i'm offering always free instruction for track panels at the moment we've got straight panel and a uh, power functions or nine volt track what you want uh yes just visit www.blockjunction.co.uk pick up your free instructions i ever once that too <laughs> okay thanks well and lastly in news today we have an update from bricklink uh, from andrew yes so it's now a year since lego bought bricklink and lego have um, done an update because of that um, there's a video on YouTube, which I haven't actually had the chance to look at yet, but it's from the uh, Lego's uh, ma marketing officer and also the head of BrickLink, Marvin Park. It sounds like they've got plans to actually invest quite a bit in BrickLink in terms of a dedicated team to support it. Um, they're developing a mobile-friendly version called BrickLink XP. I think they released that in beta um, earlier this year, so they're kind of developing that. Um, and they've also got plans to develop uh, Studio, the digital design software, um, I, I'm afraid I don't I don't have experience of using Studio, so some of the other guys might be able to give more input to this. But apparently, um, the, the My Studio and Public Studio Gallery parts are going to be integrated into the main sort of base pro, uh, platform, and also they're looking at uh, possible new features such as a uh, tool to automatically optimize your model to minimize the amount of parts you've used. So that be could be quite something quite cool. So there's a there's a write up about this on the brickfanatics.com and there's also the uh, video on YouTube. Cool, thanks Andrew. I think um some changes to Bricklink potentially exciting but my first impressions of the XP mobile layout weren't weren't that um positive really. We'll see what happens with them. Mm. Um okay, so we can move on to Will again with his selection of Lego train models on Lego Ideas. Great. So the first one we're looking at, the American Western thing, a Western train station. Uh, it is a scenic setup for a small station, can port a tower, the station built, the track and the train. Um, if I'm brutally honest, it has to be scrapped. But the station itself is very nice. It's a very nice small building with panelling and a nice... Uh, and yeah, it's just a very smart little uh, set. I would hope if this did become successful, look at uh, the similar to the... Uh, the old uh, Lone Ranger set, because the locomotive and the coach are the weakest part of this. This currently has 292 supporters, days left, uh, and I, I, I would like to see them do well. Next one we have, simply titled Steam Train, and is a massive German 2102 tank engine, which apparently can actually curve, <laughs> looking at the photographs. It's, it's big black, uh, your standard sort of German black, uh, black with red under frames, 
style loco. It's got a lot of detail. Apparently it's narrow gauge, but it works on standard loco. It's powered, so it's probably not powered, but... Oh no, it is powered, sorry. I've just seen the photograph. It's uh, yeah, a very impressive locomotive. Uh, po- bonus points are having uh, loose coal in the bunker, all like that. That has 544 supporters, 301 days left to go. Next one is Swiss Train. Uh, the very uh, recognisable, uh, very nice techniques, including a snot technique, which is like the arrows of indecision, only less indecisive. Uh, it comes with a little platform, the locomotive and a coach. Expect to be quite an expensive set, but certainly a set I would happily pick up if they say it's doing quite well at the moment. That's uh, 1,500 days left. Uh, next, we have the Woodland Freight, with an American mixed freight hauled by a very smart. Uh, somebody who knows knows a bit about American uh, and contains a flat wagon with a load of wooden logs, a cattle wagon with, a pro- uh, with apparently a cow in it, and uh, a caboose, which is probably a lease as I've seen online. <laughs> that currently has 510 supporters, 365 days to go, and was designed by M7 Rock, uh, who I feel like we've featured. And finally, we have the FPA4 via railways dessert carrying the smart yellow, blue, and black livery of Via Railways. I don't know much about American diesels, but it looks 60s, 70s American, given a modern paint, a lick of paint. Um, it seems to have a lot of detail. Nice brick-built livery, uh, and is very, very smart. That has 180, uh, sorry, 182 supporters, 230 days left, and is designed by He's in the Pie. And uh, that's uh, Lego Ideas this week. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Will. Some decent sets there, I think. I do quite like the, um, was it the Hickory Station, the first one? Yeah. The Woodland I the, Freight looked quite smart. If they if they put the Woodland Freight with the Hickory Station, that's actually a really nice set also. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, as an American who can't build American engines, it's really nice to look at that Woodland Freight set. Don't get any ideas, Trace. <laughs> no, Matt says the FPA4 is a Canadian model, not, not oh, American. You, but, yeah. It's all American to me. It's in the American <laughs> continent. <laughs> yeah, it's part of our land mass. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> so we're back to time before the American Empire take them over. <laughs> oh, uh, we can move on to our topic of the podcast, which is British locomotives as Lego models. Um, so British locomotives are hugely varied from early steam area to contemporary diesel and electric. Um, they present their own challenges in building, which I'm sure somebody will cover a little bit later for us. Um I think it's worth mentioning to start with, and people feel free to chip in if you can suggest others. But there are a lot of builders out there um, around the world who have already tackled British locos. Um, so Carl Greatrix's Tornado, Michael Gale's Class 43, uh, Maceo Hidnika's uh, Class 08, uh, hey. Gronk, which Chris has many, many copies of. Um <laughs> There are also other modelers, so Hod Carrier on, uh, I think he's on Flickr, isn't he? Um, uh, I'm Br- he builds and, uh, yeah, you're right. We've also got Wes Turngreat, um, who builds some really stunning models, I think mostly digitally, but they're some really nice ones. Uh, the king of the I'm sure some members can pull up uh, more details of later on. There's also Andrew Lord, who sells instructions for British Locos. Uh, Kevin Coppas, a.k.a. Nicker Bricker Glory. And, of course, there's Isaac Smith, uh, one of our members who isn't on the podcast today, sadly. Yep, so we've got a decent overview there of um, some modelers and some prototypes. Um, I think what's interesting is, I suppose, because a lot of the railways started in Britain in some ways, um, that a lot of non-British builders end up building British locos like Sam, our guest today, um, an Australian who builds British mm. locos. So, what why, what makes you pick British yep. locos, Sam, over um, over others? A plethora uh, of Australian locos you have. It, there is, and not to like um, you know pick favourites, but I think it's just the way I was sort of brought up when because I did have a big uh, connection with trains. Like I'd always love watching them wherever I was, and I, I did like. Uh, you know, go down to a lot of Australian locos and see them and do stuff like that. But I think, you know, just watching old DVDs that I used to get, you know, um, the news agents or something like that and seeing the British locos and, you know, the beautiful liveries and sort of the way they were all preserved in the end, even though they were sort of going out of style. Um, I don't know. I I feel like there's just a lot more pride in uh, British locos than there is 
apart from American Navy, but um, just something about them that always just draws to me, the colours, the shapes, the unique designs. Like, I think they set the bar, really. Um, I think that's why I, I like them so much compared to others. Yeah, I suppose if you look at the most European, particularly steam era locomotives, seem to just be black and red. Um, yeah. And not particularly exciting to build, I suppose, once you've built one. Do they all look the yeah, same? Yeah, that's it. No, but then you, you got, start like, to look you got at, like, examples. grouping liveries and things, and that's always fun to tackle. Yeah, that's it. It's like, um, like there, there are standouts in every country, you know, like not all American engines are the giant black, you know, huge machines, or like some have got quite charm to them, and then you've got other ones like in Australia that, you know, the majority, I think, are a bit, you know, basic, broad, and just functional. But there are, you know, nice examples out there. But just from British, you look at every design ever and you just think, you know, they all compete against each other because they're just so unique in their own right. I'd agree with that. Uh, Sam, I've got a weird question for you. Stuff that you're releasing yeah. on your Patreon, um, if it's been an exclusive for only your Patreon members to see, can we talk about it? Or would you prefer that that's left in the dark? <laughs> How exclusive are we talking? I, I think that'd be all right to share some secrets. Okay, because I've been trying to work on building a P-Class forever, and your new rendition of that little <laughs> shit looks so good. And I want to know how yeah. it scales compared to, like, your V1 and the, the, um, the P2. P-Class is, I think, the smallest loco I have right now, and it was a real um, challenge for me because I've done several attempts of it in the past using a um, four-wide boiler, and I think this is the first time ever I've actually tried to use um, a three-stud wide boiler. And I was a bit hesitant at f um, first just because, you know, going so small can be hard to keep it neat and tidy and flush. But, um, yeah, it's, it was a challenge to build the P-Class. It's just because of how little it is, you know, uh, sacrificing a lot of details for more forms. Um, I think that was the key to it, just to get the shape right. Because when you're going so small, it's hard to fit everything in. Right. Uh, yeah. Mm. You normally build in seven wide, right? Or are you eight? Yep. No, I, I'm seven. And the P-Class was seven um, on the running plate. But the, the boiler is three wide and the tanks go out to about, I think it's 5.5. And then the cab is 4.5 wide. Okay. I think so. Uh, Something so like that. I could be wrong. Yeah. No, 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 no. So, so circling it back around then, what... I guess what's the driven motivation for you to tackle something that small uh, when it when a lot of your work, like, again, the V1, the P2, um, even your hall class, like, yep. they're these big monsters that are just gorgeous to look at. Mm. Well, I think that's why, I, you know, I've got so many big engines going on. Like, right now, I'm currently finishing the Bayer Garrett, and I've just finished the Class 85, which was, it's like, it's... Bigger than you think, like you just think it's a long rectangular shape, but there's a lot that goes into it. And so I think <laughs> after fiddling with those, I just needed like a little break, but something that's still challenging for me, you know. Um, so the E2 and the P class, they were really nice to just, you know, do over a couple of nights, you know, and just step back a bit from the larger scales and save some money. <laughs> <laughs> you know Don't what? You're not money. wrong. I can, I can agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to do it every now and then <laughs> yeah no, absolutely oh that's awesome yes. oh uh so, actually no sorry just looking at the chat right now uh they brought up your electric engine that you made do you have any more of those in the in the works i really liked building um the 85 like a lot more than i previously thought and i think it was just the whole like taking a break from steam as well like you know sacrificing all the connecting rods and all the stress <laughs> of that um, so I do, I do have a few more planned um, that I haven't announced yet, but I think there's at least three or four, and um, I'm pretty excited to show them off soon. Three or yeah, four. They're very, Calm they're down. very unique. <laughs> not, they're not sort of, yeah, they're not sort of the uh, more generic ones, but uh, more the unique examples from British Rails. So, yeah. So I'm, I've, I've, got a, a, I've got a semi-tangential question. First off. <laughs> Were you aware that some Terriers were built for Australia? Uh, the Terrier Club. The somebody ABSL told me terriers. that. <laughs> the Terrier Club uh, just initiated so Yeah, so next question. Any idea what they look like and do you want to build one? <laughs> <laughs> I remember someone telling me about it, but I didn't 
really understand where they would have gone because as far as um, i understand they were built for the same thing original the english ones suburban yep. trains but they didn't last okay. like no, so they're they're right. yeah no, so there's the same situation with the, uh, the K-Class, too, where that was taken to Australia and then just fiddled around with. And... Wait, early Australian locos were basically British locos that were made a little bit hardier. <laughs> okay, so we have a um, new guest joining. So Stuart, a.k.a. Romsey Lego Rail, uh, will be joining us for the for the rest of the podcast as well. Um, so welcome, Stuart, from whenever, uh, whenever he's able to join the channel for us. Um, I think the... Diversion into British locos is is quite handy, and I really love Sam's BR Class eighty five. It looks absolutely superb, and we will link that in the description. Um, but I think this is a good time to pass across to um, Mr. Miller, who's going to walk us through some uh, various designs for the BR Class O eight or the the Gronk, which he loves so much. So, Chris, before I go into that, I want to know why Sam hasn't built the F Class version. F class, yeah, the Australian version of the Gronk. <laughs> he's gone Death very, class. very quiet. <laughs> yes, yes, he doesn't he... care. <laughs> he may have, have lost audio connection or something. <laughs> You'll have to wait for um, Sam to come back. So, would you like to talk us through the all of the variations of Lego Gronks you found? Oh, well, where, where do you? Well, of course, you have to start with. Uh... Mr. Hedeker's design. I think everyone has built one based on that design. Uh, whether they've kept it aim or adapted it or powered it or not powered it. Uh, I have a couple of them I've built. How much is a couple? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, 13 is one or two. <laughs> I, think I, I think I did say I was stopping at eight for the, so because, it's, because it's an 08, of course. But I currently have five more that I'm building that I haven't told anyone about. Oh my god, <laughs> that's un- that's unhealthy. Where's your F? Where's your F class, Sam? I've got a O eight. No, 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 a no. Black no. one not from the. Uh... You need to call them F class. They're different. <laughs> Sam, would it be possible for you to uh... give a Miller the instructions to your Gronk so he could do a proper one? <laughs> Send him the real thing. <laughs> How dare you? I can't remember the name of the chap, but. One of our winners was an 08 in that awards thing. Yeah, that was the LNUR uh, selected one, right, that we chose? Yep, I, I remember think it that. was. Yeah. I thought we went for the Western. I know an 08 won, anyway. That would have been the... full. Yeah, I can't remember which white, oh, came first and which came second, actually. <laughs> um, it was Yeah, the nice models. The 08 came first, of course. Silly. God. Knowing <laughs> LNUR. <laughs> As for other 08 models... Um, I think I'd be doing everyone a disservice by picking certain ones. Uh, from a quick Google search I did, was <laughs> hundreds of different builds and styles. Some from basic, but still still the basic ideas. Some that got so much detail, your eyes would bleed looking at it too long. Well, that's my favorite thing that I think Gronk. James does. Is he builds everything Gronk, using Gronk, brackets Gronk, and building Gronk, it sideways. Sideways, <laughs> upways. <laughs> Got Lego I on the ceiling at this point. I, 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 no, I, mean, I, I, I keep trying to explain to him. Every layout needs exactly and only one Gronk because the Gronk is there to shunt the coaches into the station. Big, impressive steam to haul up and down the line. Unfortunately, <laughs> the big, impressive steam engine is still in someone's shed being built for the last 40 years. <laughs> no, P2 hasn't taken that long and Tornado is finished. <laughs> well, no, it's done. Cool. But, yeah, I mean, here's really the thing, though. That's the beauty of anticipation. You see Gronks every day. You see Diesels every day. But I think Will put it best where it's the romanticism of when steam engines finally come into service that uh, is really that's appealing because it's, it's a rare but very fruitful occasion. Anticipation has too many letters in it. I like the word now when we have Gronks now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, looking at my collection, I've got quite a lot of not Gronks now, too. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the Gronk segment, everyone. You can all leave now. <laughs> oh god, we that done now. That's that's good. 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 from here. The release <laughs> six, six, podcast six, ten done. Yeah, so moving on from Gronks, um, we'll introduce uh, Stuart briefly, who's uh, been able to join us now. So, hello, Stuart. Welcome back. 
I'm there. I'm there. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Hello. Right. That's all right. Good morning, yeah. um, don't, don't move and try. Don't move and try and help out with podcasts at the same time. That's all I can say. House moves. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, opening up questions to members and guests. Um, I think we'll start with. Um, we mentioned towards the start that I think designing British locos in Lego present their own challenges compared to some of the larger American locos. So what is, or what would you say is the biggest challenge of building British locos over, say, an American loco? And we'll start with Stuart since he's, since he's here, and then we can work through whoever else wants to take part. I can easily summarise that. Curves. In one word, <laughs> curve. <laughs> That here, here endeth the podcast. <laughs> I just because having tried to build the having tried to build the class 33, it's actually a very real reflection of the fact the British loading gauge means the designers of the original prototypes had to squeeze things in. I mean, you look at a Deltic and uh Pete Robinson's Deltic, which I just kept looking at. I think it's Pete Robinson, isn't it? Paul Robinson, maybe Paul Robinson's. Mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. You know, you look at those kind of prototypes and the, the kind of the weeks that I had to make the class 33. Well, they, there you go. Look, one part, one single part made that model possible for me. And that's the one by six mudguard that just sits above the um, just sits above the windscreen there. Um, oh, yes. If that curve hadn't been in place, I honestly don't think I could have even tried to get a 33 looking you know as, as i liked it in the picture you see there but you know it is a reflection of british prototypes that the guys had limited loading gauge to work with so unlike a a big i have to say more boxy more boxy you know kind of um, prototypes of continental and particularly u.s prototypes you know the guys have to worry less about those kind of things so i think that's the enduring challenge of british modeling in lego I think you did a fantastic job with that class 33. You really captured the uh, character of the loco. Oh, thanks. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. That that was that was like at least nine months of tweaking, fiddling, uh, and there you go. Sam's nailed it. Yeah, lots more curves. Yeah, curves. I think think curves are the topic for this podcast. Sometimes yeah. diesels are just referred to as boxes on wheels, but when you try and <laughs> make something look like an actual British loco, you realise that they're nothing of the sort. I think, I think over to well. um, somebody else. So should we go to Trace? So what do you think? Is it curves, the issue with British locos in Lego? Uh, curves are the worst, uh, definitely. <laughs> I think the big thing that's tough for me when I'm building British locos is that there's a lot of small, uh, kind of what Stuart said, where there's a lot of small detail. Um, like being able to decide whether or not you want to use handrails, whether or not you want to include... Um, a whistle or some sort of valve gear that's underneath it there too. Uh, it's, mm. it's robbing Peter to pay Paul by choosing what's going to accent your loco correctly and what's going to be a hindrance, uh, hindrance to it running in the first place. Um, but I will say, as Lego's gone on, like past the, the era of Carl Gray tricks and things like that, we've gotten a lot of really new pieces. Like uh, those Harry Potter wands are a godsend to me when it comes to doing handrails. Um, we've gotten a lot of new pearl gold pieces that work really well for uh, pipe work and everything like that too. Um, so it's not difficult. It's just decision making that I think is the ultimate deciding factor when you're building. What about um, Sam? Yeah. Do you do you agree with um, Trace and Stuart so far? Oh, definitely. Two things I reckon it's the hardest part is first when like if you're building a small model or even like a medium size to large model. I think the hardest part is there's a lot of compromise, and when you're building, sometimes you focus on a feature, and it can be difficult to decide whether what's better to focus on like what's going to grab the attention of people what's going to stand out better um like what are you going to sacrifice to make that look good or what are you not going to sacrifice to get the whole thing looking a bit more cohesive and <laughs> the second thing on top of curves is what i'd say is um wr engine and late br engine the slope boilers are like they drive me crazy <laughs> yeah, i honestly think it's why i've stood clear of all those um like the whole class of castle, <laughs> like just trying to like fill the gaps in and, you know, create that difficult angle. It's, it's a nightmare. I think Andrew was the one who made the real breakthrough with his mana class. And I remember I t <laughs> instantly when he came up with a solution, I was like, oh, finally I can make a whole class. 
<laughs> there is an answer. <laughs> there is a God. He has spoken. He, he is let's, good let's, like let's not get carried away now. Andrew has spoken. <laughs> <again. laughs> yep. But no, definitely. I think so. Yeah, I think I think I agree. And um, obviously, post links to many many models in the uh, in the description for the podcast as well, so people can can look through. We did have a correction or um, an addition, perhaps from Matt. Um, over clarification of who won the LNUR award, which we couldn't remember. So Andy Mitchell, a.k.a. Hod Carrier, won second prize with his uh, really lovely warship. And Paul Robinson oh, won really the really LNUR cool. award um, with his 08, uh, which is not that surprising, that one, when it was the choice of LNUR members, really. That was, that was <laughs> bound to be. Um, I, I'd, like, okay, I'd, like so... to mention, I'd like to mention something that the other guys haven't mentioned between American and British. In American, they are so much bigger. They can provide so much more space for rodding and accurate rodding that even even in Lego, you can do a quite impressive job because a British loco, there are people who model and it's a big and expensive job and it looks a bit weird compared to it. But the Americans can go up to 10 wide and that gives you a lot of space for rodding. Um, and I, I'm sure mm-hmm. for uh, Sam particular will, will, will agree, the hardest part of any scene that looks anything like a nightmare. I lose countless sleep from it. <laughs> I'm losing sleep tonight. Booking of losing countless sleep. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, moving on. We did have a, a good point raised by Andrew, I think, which would be um, the range of liveries for British locos. They do make them quite appealing. We talked about the, the range of colours that locos come in. Um, so, does anybody have a favourite livery and loco combination? And we'll start with the guests. So, we'll start with um, Sam this time. It used to be Elnia Apple Green, but I can honestly say it's now um, Experimental Electric Blue from British Rail. Of it, it's it just pops so much, and it reminds me of um, the Midland Pullman. Just that colour scheme, it just shouts for me for some reason. It works well. Yeah, it does. They they do look really stunning in that um, that colour. And I imagine we might get the same answer from Stuart, but um, we'll see. So, Stuart, what's your favourite livery and loco combination? Yeah, so I, also for me, just kind of briefly say as well, this this call has got so many so much great stuff, and I don't want to sort of call out individuals, but you know, for the call to be on trace with these LBSCRK class, you know, and and I think what that's pointing out and Sam with with that AC electrics I mean look AC electrics and K classes those two you know and I don't even start on the 08s there's some great prototypes being built here and and the match of the right Lego colors with the Lego palette the, the, the you know the kind of the yeah series of colors you can find on Lego that that gives it's almost you start from the color sometimes um, and I think Sam, you did a cracking job on that AC electric. All we need now is the catenary, you know, strung across the whole layout. That would be <laughs> lovely. <laughs> I'll get on to it. Funny, funny you should say that. I did. I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on wandering off on one, but I did actually try a little bit of flex when when flex was more widely available back in the early 2000s, just to see how the catenary look. It would have been ruinous on the money, but it, it looked <laughs> yeah. okay. But Isn't oh, everything about the Lego train no, hobby ruinous on the wallet? Oh, tell me, yeah. My, 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 um, just as my a side favorite. note on the um, Midlands um, electric blue, are, are you aware that recently they've taken an a HST set and painted it into the same livery as the old blue? I have Pullman? seen that. Oh, it is gorgeous. Blue. It's like a dream come true to see that. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It looks spectacular. Yeah. I'm, I'm close to building it. Can, yeah. Oh, okay. Watch that one. Can I just add for the colours? Uh, now this is this is proper nerd territory here, so sorry, alert already. Um, <laughs> if I ever get time after the house move, I've got a thing where it would be really nice just to call out a few of the colours because there's some really nice websites that actually list out Lego colours in terms of Pantone, you know, proper, you know, and that, that a lot of that stuff's already done. So when I was trying to do the um, stuff for Romsey, and Romsey was going network southeast for a day i tripped over a list of railway colors in pantones and i thought hey that that would be nice because you can pretty much match the liveries you know and the colors to the official color designations and actually who knew lego blue is identical color to network southeast blue and you know i might eventually just get a little spreadsheet together of you know closest matches in terms of 
you know, some of the official colours designation just to help people go, should it be that green or that green? Actually, it just helps to know which colours are which. Um, so I might eventually do that, but say n- nerd nerd mode off there, you know. Well, oh, <laughs> sounds like quite a useful. It sounds like a good idea. Yeah, it sounds like a useful resource. So if you want yeah. some help with that, I'm sure we can stick that on the Alan Yard website as a as a resource for people. It will certainly yeah. be handy. And I think talking about different liveries and different colours, I, I think we can't really go without mentioning Trace here because he builds in all sorts of wonderful and weird colours. So, Trace, do you have a favourite livery and uh, locomotive combination? I do. Actually, the LBSCR livery uh, that I did my H2 Atlantic in at first was what got me back into doing, like, Lego railroading or building steam engines in Lego. But the surprising thing, this whole... Uh, the, the the whole Terrier project that I've been on right now is just kind of to goof around with colors and see what parts are available. And the one that surprised me was using that bright, like, lime green color for the LWSR livery on the on the one Terrier. It just looks so distinctive, again, so cool. and especially against, like, my dark, tan, dark, uh, olive green background. It just really pops in a fun way, uh, similar to Sam's Electric Blue, where it's just yeah. uh, it's nice to have something that unique and that uh, distinctive that you can kind of call your own. They're just starting off Tuesdays, Trace. <laughs> yeah, uh, Tuesdays probably have to end soon just because I'm running out of colors. I've got two more in the pipeline, but that's about it. But you, you found a great <laughs> use for reddish brown because I, I, I do a lot of early, B, you know, sort of mid 70s BR stuff where the old color brown is an absolute dead spot for the that marsh um, umber that that well yeah because the reddish brown is a great one for marsh umber um yeah. the, the 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 old brown which i just can't buy enough of on bricklink is a great one for br bulk site the 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 kind of fitted yeah. van yeah so you know you've opened up a whole world of you know lbscr use for the reddish brown Oh, no, this is my favorite podcast we've ever done, guys. This is awesome. So <laughs> we've not even mentioned trees yet either. I know we'll get there. Oh, it's what a journey! I'm jazzed. <laughs> if I could um, throw an extra favorite livery of mine into the mix, it would be um, Bullied Pacifics in the malachite green with the yellow lining. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Um, Actually, oh. even the uh, yeah that uh, so techno, techno Andrew needs to come on here because his his were the, I think the first one I saw in that. But I tell you what, the older locomotives, uh, a Brighton Atlantic in that livery is absolutely glorious. It really suited some of the older locos when it was applied to them. Le- yeah. Lego's green color lends itself pretty well to that Malachite green livery. If I'm not yeah, mistaken, there's color. also a, an Australian Streamlines loco which has quite a similar livery. Sam might be able to correct me on that. Uh, I think that's the South Australian one. Yeah, that's uh, the same thing. Yeah, that's 6901, right? That's it. Jeez. <laughs> I should know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't. But... Okay. Thanks, well... Trace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, you had something to raise about liveries, I think. Best livery of all, and it works on so many locomotives. The intercity livery, the black, white, and red stripe with the is it a swift or a swallow? Swallow, a swallow, swallow one, yeah. A canary with the uh, with a canary on the side. <laughs> it it goes on everything. It works so well. It, does, even, it, it even goes really on a hard. gronk. There's even a gronk with it on. <laughs> <laughs> it, looks, it looks amazing. It is quite a smart. It's... I quite like the Network Southeast um, toothpaste livery. I think that's. I grew up with that. I love that livery. It is especially on the plastic flying pigs. Mwah. <laughs> I mean, I've even seen. I mean, it, it's a mock-up. They never actually put it on a, a a real steam engine. But there's a steam engine with the intercity livery on it, and it doesn't look bad. They toyed with doing the Virgin one on the P2 if they could get Vir- uh, so the, uh, the the A1. If... Sadly, the sponsorship never came in. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. Yeah. It would have been awesome having, having an A1 running around in the original Virgin Cross Country. It, it should have had a, a yellow front end as well, just to upset everybody. I mean, they kind of would have had to have done that. But... <laughs> <laughs> this big yellow circle on the front. <laughs> I think Will had something next for us on liveries and part so, availability. So, yeah, I, I don't really have a favourite loco livery combo. I tend to just go for so I prefer Big Four. I've always preferred Big Four. Uh, and the Big Four liveries are dark red, light green, uh, standard green, dark green, and black. And with the exception of black, all of those colours are bloody expensive. 
Uh, green is not so bad until you try to put handrails on anything, and then you're looking at about one pound fifty plus a pop for the uh, tiled clips, which is why my uh, it, um, get on a blue bricks for that. I've started using it; and it's saved me so much because the quality is pretty much identical, and you get the color choice of your um, want. Uh, the, the main problem I have is uh, personal use. That's fine. Um, with the exception of custom wheels, because you just can't build some prototypes with the, without them, I try and avoid using non-standard Lego parts because when I'm doing instructions, they, they, they're new to the hobby and I don't want to complicate it. So you go to BritLink for these bits and then you go to America for these bits and you go to somewhere in Europe for these <laughs> But uh, Fair enough, yeah, man. For personal use, I might have to look at that. But, oh, it's just... it's It's horrible. You've designed this beautiful locomotive and then you go to look at the cost of it and it's like, Thousands of pounds because you wanted dark. <laughs> or, there's a, or there's a single part you need you can't replace it with, but it doesn't come in that color. Oh, I, I tried oh, to. Uh, I, I tried to redesign my first iteration of Hogwarts Castle to be dark green. Um, it's a very basic model. It's basically a heavily upgraded set, and I gave up before I'd finished the tender because the amount of parts changes I had to make to turn it from red to dark green. It was a new build. It was a completely new and I just gave up on it. It's, it's also frustrating from the point of view of trying to give people ideas. You get this perfect build in one colour. Here's the other colours you can do. You'll have to do some part swap. Not ideal when you're trying to do business. <laughs> My sum, you need, you need 95% of it. Yeah, that, that tender's a different tender, mate. <laughs> okay, any more on deliveries? Or do we want to just move on? Point, just last point. I saw a note on the chat about dark green is tough to build in. Oh, I tell you, though. So, it, it, for some reason, it's a finger magnet. It's a fingerprint magnet. When I was building the side of the Class 33, I, I, th I, th I thought I might have to put the flipping gloves on at one point. And I don't know why some <laughs> colours just really show up. Then it's not kind of that, that. That doesn't sound quite as weird as it seems. But I, I just couldn't build it without getting, you know, kind of thumbprints. But it's a glorious. It's a lovely colour. I think I'm gonna have to do more. You know, some celebrity. You know. Locos like that dark green one, it's lovely. You think, you, think, you think that's bad? Touching Try on that, that real quick, dark green and dark red. Sorry, Sam. I, I was just going to say, touching on the dark green, like you know, fingerprint marks and stuff like that. I think the thing that annoys me most is building in dark green and dark red. You get the worst color um, matches. Like you'll see one part looking completely different to another. I don't know if anyone else gets that, but oh, it drives me nuts. Yeah. It's shocking. Dark red is also bad for that, I found. I think the dark colours for some reason, I think and at some point like let's change them very slightly. Yeah. Okay. Um so moving on then. Um we had a couple of notes in the chat for the podcast about um well we've already discussed custom parts a little bit, um, and also lining, stickers, decals, that sort of thing. So um Stuart, do you want to Start us off with that because I think you suggested some of that. I'm, I'm going to take a, a deep breath to start, but I've always, always tried to avoid. So no, let me kind of rewind. I think the best way of putting it for me is you, look, you build according to the kind of design rules that you have in your head. And my view is there's a point where I never cut. I, I can't get around the idea of cutting parts. It doesn't feel right to me, but I'll just say that's where I'm at. Look, others build great models. And I think, you know, one of the ones I saw was Carl Great Tricks, uh, Great Tricks on uh, yes. Flickr. And, you know, it's, it's it's some of the stuff he builds is fantastic. But and then I look at it and go, yeah, but that's cut. And I'm thinking, does that work for me? So I don't think any I'm not going to say anything on this call where it goes, thou shalt not do. Right? It's up to you, everybody, I think, how they work. Uh, the rules of the game in my head are these. I'll use, I, I, I don't cut parts, otherwise I think, well, I might as well start from somewhere else. And I can say stickers. I don't use stickers to change the shape of parts. That's just my preference. I am about to use some stickers, and there's some only to line in. Um, I've got some Mark 1s underway, which I'll, I'll kind of show in a bit. Um but they're only to provide the window framing that I can't get otherwise. So the overall shape of the window, yeah, is fixed. I'm not going to change it. So I wouldn't change the shape of a windscreen. So I had to try and work out how I was going to do the Class 33 windscreen without using stickers, which is my preference. Others 
sure we'll have different. All I'm going to do on the Mark 1s is to put in the little ventilators and trim line, trim line tape recommended. It's a radio control plane um, trimming. Really good. Nice, different width of colours, different in the different widths, different colours, and it's really easy to stick. So if I ever use stickers, I'd only do that. Hopefully that oh, makes okay. sense. Yes. Yeah, I think that's that's fairly reasonable. I think every builder has their own limitations on where they would and wouldn't put pieces or where they would and wouldn't use stickers. I know yeah. some builders, um, not necessarily in the, the Lego train world, but some builders will only use um, the lining from official Lego sticker sets. So once you pull out the real stickers, the sort of white lining or the black lining around them, some builders will only use that because it's still technically an official Lego sticker. That's, um, that's what I'm, yeah, I think, I think I might have to cheat a little bit on this one, but I'm not changing overall shape, which is a kind of weird internal rule that I've, but it works for me. Yeah. I, think, I think that's right. And it helps to, if you're consistent with that, then the models tend to have a consistency to them. So they, you know, the locos fit with the carriages and the rolling stock. Because they're built to the same style and the same rules, um, so I think I think and that's that I think, I think, and I think the internal rules also help to set yourself the challenges. Like back to the window on the class thirty three, I think if I tried to do a flat window and then put stickers on it to get the shape, I don't think I'd have set myself such a satisfying challenge to try and get the shape using the bricks without the stickers. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. I think um, so. We've got Sam on the call who also uses stickers, and Chris has recently completed a model as well with uh, some lining and stickers on. So, if we go with Sam first, and then try and flip across to Chris. So, Sam, what's your experience of um, stickers, particularly the P two, which won the Rick Train Awards, um, had quite a lot of intricate lining on it, from what I remember. It like. It definitely took me a long time, and I never started out with the intention of using stickers. Preferably, when I started doing this, uh, I did use brick-built lining because I was a huge fan of um, Andrew's work, and I was really inspired by that. Slowly over time, for whatever reason, I, I just wanted to try and do stickers, and I think the only problem with doing brick-built lining for me is sometimes there were limitations um, when you're trying to capture all those lines. Like, I remember doing the V2 in like a dark green, uh, Brunswick green lining. And I was trying to get that orange lining on the cab and I, I, I just couldn't like it, just looked too bulky for me. And so I think at that point I sort of went to the mindset of, I think I'll give myself a new challenge and try and just build the model first and then worry about um, the decorative side later. So I think that's sort of where I got. I, I don't really use stickers to change the shape like i don't think i've done that to date like if i want to change the shape i'll get out the stanley knife and you know, embrace that on my soul <laughs> but um... I'm, I'm on mute in case i cough <laughs> but it, that's your that's but that's seriously that's that's your what you might call design principle sam and i think that's good as long as everybody's consistent within themselves i think you know I it, and i totally get it everyone's got different preferences through experience or favorability like i think this is just where i'm at now is where i've gotten to and um I, i'm pretty happy with where i'm at i think i, I wouldn't change anything now i think i'm set and, and the, sort of my view. the p2 coming up there just illustrates how good it is crucially when it's done well and that's 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 not an easy one to do that linear lining that's pretty oh, yeah, well yeah that's it so sam you, you so you, you didn't it's... you didn't plan out the lining at all because um no we're not I was, when my I started three, back on. Sorry. <laughs> hey, no, sorry. I was just saying that that's the one thing. Uh, the one thing that clearly, from when I was building the A, in a very long time, the boiler design was made very conscious, trying to work out the spacing of the lining compared to the prototype. Um, the the reason it had as many clips as it for the handrail was because looking at the prototype, <laughs> the clips were just about at the same. The 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 handrail holders just about the same as the lining so i had to work out where they need and how the lining fit around them before i did it and i'm really glad i did because the lining the boiler absolute pleasure compared yeah. to the rest of the bloody loco where i didn't think about it <laughs> <laughs> no I'm, there are points like that where you do actually have to think about it but i think for me you know get it right first make sure the shape's right it functions well and then yeah i tend to worry yeah. about the stickers afterward 
which doesn't always work out because, you know, like you said, if you don't pre-plan sometimes and you're putting the stickers on, you realise the part's elevated a little more than another part and you get mm. some, like, weird crease in the lining, which doesn't look great, but you've got to live with it. So I yeah. think it's right. Yeah, you, you definitely should take it in mind that even I don't. But... How do you cope with the curved ends of the uh, front of the tender and the back of the cab on LA? Because I, it's like deciding where the lining should stop is difficult when yours is square and theirs is curved. <laughs> it's. I'm still not sure I made the right decisions. I don't really on like. It. It's it's hard to call it. I think you just got to sort of go for what looks best to the eye in the end because yeah. it is hard with the limitations of the model. But yeah, well, the same there. What about uh, Chris? Do you want to talk us through what you've been lining recently? Not really. <laughs> I'm then fine. Um, I've nearly, I say nearly, it's like 99% finished. Um, Royal Mail Train uh, 325. And that has more stickers and lining on it than any other locomotive. Um, I don't know if any of you noticed with stickers and lining, but the, they like to stick to everything except the bit you actually want it to stick on. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, mine, it, all the stickers are on flat, straight edges and flat bricks. There's no curves, there's no odd shapes. And I'm just, you know, I've got a, a straight yellow line. I'm just going to put it on. I hold it at both ends, put it on. Look, yeah, that's perfect. Flatten it down, and then it starts peeling off. And it's like that. <laughs> oh, one of my apron splashes. Um, First one I did, I did slightly different to all the others, and it is looking at me now going, I'm peeling off. Are you going to do something about me? And I'm like, oh, I don't want to take you apart. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my, two, my two top tips, though, the lining, um, if it's on an edge that, that will be hidden by another brick, I just wrap an extra yeah. bit around the back of the brick and yeah. then put another brick against it. That'll clamp it down. Yeah, that's um, a really... The, yeah, the other tip, if you want lines to end perfectly flat and they end at a brick edge, put another brick on top and then in the line where the two bricks join, get a very sharp blade or knife and just gently rub back and forth where the brick joins. And then you can lift the brick off and peel the excess off and you'll have two flush lines. Actual useful information yeah, sometimes, from <laughs> Sometimes I like... Uh, I think the hardest one for me is putting stickers on curves, and especially like if you look at a um, LNER engine and you want the red um, lining on the piston block, sometimes I'll cut like a big black sticker and cover it at the bottom of the ends. So it's just sitting on top of the red, but because there's more surface area, like it'll cover it up and you still keep the shape. Yeah. That's another one I do sometimes, but yeah, on it is tricky. On one of the on the uh, intercity gronk that I built, there was a bit where I tried lining and it was just it was not having it. Uh, <laughs> so I, I ended up bringing out the Warhammer paint and I painted it instead. <laughs> <laughs> so technically, that would have been the most stickered and vinyl locomotive, but because of that, it's actually the most painted. <laughs> Lego, you can't Lego tell paint. unless you really, Lego really trains is, painting is why I moved away from normal model railways because i hate painting i can't i can't, yeah. I can't, I can't, I can't get my head around kind of you know i, I gave up painting to do you know i enjoy oh. lego trains but then i do painting again ah. i mean i've got this this red paint i like i like water. to pretend that i am above painting but yeah it's exactly that <laughs> i've got i've got this red paint that i bought from warhammer about 20 years ago it still doesn't need like stirring it still works it's on my trains, and it's even on my car in places where I've I've hidden scratches. <laughs> it covers everything, and it, it it's one Got your money, it's sweet. one red. But it doesn't matter what other red you put on; it always matches. It's so weird. It's like, oh look, this is more of a pinkish red. Yet yeah, matches. Oh look, this is a this is a burgundy. Yet yeah, matches. You can have any red color as long as it's red, though. No. Mm. Did, did you build that? Did you build that Royal Mile train in lime green, and then just decided, I ah, have it on red? <laughs> if you look really close at the Royal Mail train, um, I actually did build it pink at first, and then realised my mistake. So I got the paint rollers out, and now you can't tell. 
It's another episode of Miller Talks Rubbish. (laughs) That's just every podcast, isn't it? Um, um, (laughs) Sorry, before we go off on a tangent. um, Also, if you've got a train, for example, the Royal Mail train, you need you need vinyls and stickers, like even just the mail logo. It makes a hell of a difference. Yeah, It'd just be a, a bit there's no other way of doing it. You know, it would be quite I, a boring I, red train otherwise. I mean, it'd be just a red train with a couple like, of yellow stripes on it. I resisted, although I planned to line it anyway. I resisted lining the A3 for a very long time, partly because I was really happy with how I'd captured the shape eventually. Um, but the the thing that finally did it for me is I post uh, we uh, well the, the photo the cards share the times. Posed it next to uh, another seven wide A3 and a six wide A3, and it looks so pathetic compared to the two lined A3s in, in either side of it, or uh, next to it. I can't remember which, which order they were in. So I was like, "Yeah, you're getting lined. You're not doing yourself any favors not being lined." <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just not quite complete. No, it's it's like it, and everybody. I mean, I, I mean, kid. I, I once the the best memory I have of the loco was we did a show at the Neem Valley Railway, and we were in a mail van. Uh, with big open doors, and there was a kid who had his head out the window of the train that's about to depart. I've just come back from with my breakfast on the Sunday morning. I think I'll set the A3 running. So I put it on the track, put the Pullmans on, and all I hear from the train is, Ah, oh, flying Scotsman! And I was just like, that's brilliant, that when a kid can recognise exactly what class of loco it is, as is. But yeah, you put it next to somebody who's put the effort into lining, and you're like, oh boy, there's, there's no reason not to line it. It's the difference it makes is so impressive that if you don't line it, if you stick to being pure, because there's no way I could brick build the lining, L N E R lining into an A three. There's just no way I can do it. If you don't build the lining in, you just you, you you're doing yourself down. Your train doesn't look as good as it could look, and there's no reason for it other than a day's work on line. So we've but, talked. That's, is anybody considering? So you know, for example, that that I still love the look of that Royal Mail train, and it's got those odd things. You know, kind of like oddities or unusual prototypes, it, like the it's three. It's okay. Parts. You can say it's the best model you've ever seen if you want to. It's, 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 it's tough competition in in uh, kind of on the core. Lots <laughs> not, of good unusual liveries. I think to be fair, is what well, unusual is good as well. Just make people look twice. I think that's good. So, has anybody considered rather than lining, going for printing? I might just print a couple of things. One is the class thirty three nameplate easily and printing the head code at the front. So rather than lining, getting a professionally printed option. Well, I've actually be been... My, oh, sorry, be my preference, I think, for printing. Um, printing is fine for detail work and text like number plates, name boards, things like that. Um, but I think if you're doing the lining um, on a whole train, like uh, Chris has lined his mail train, if you're doing that with custom prints, it's probably a step too far for your wallet, if nothing else. Okay, so we've spoken a lot about locomotive models, um, but we've certainly within LNUR, we've made a concerted effort to build up rakes of uh, carriages and um, rolling stock, which fits with a range of locomotives because builders tend to focus on the the glamorous locomotives and not the rolling stock. Um, So I'll pass across to Will, who led an effort to build some interchangeable rolling stock which looked okay with a range of um range of locos so over to will yes so um we uh, i designed uh, what we call the mark 0.5 because it's too short and sh- narrow to be a proper mark one um for the play out and also for the smaller scale locos that run on the big layout and when we were deciding to build a rake for the lnur we had a big discussion about color scheme and we settled in the end on the compromise of blue and gray on the grounds that late era steam ran with a little bit of blue and gray, steam specials of any color ran with blue and gray, diesels, everything up to the night that was running up to the late 90s could be seen with blue and gray coaches. So it gave us a great range in theory of applicable locomotives that can run uh, these coaches. But in practice, what happened was we found that nothing really, uh, we didn't have enough blue locos and everything else just kind of didn't feel right. Um, since built a blood and custard rake in, of the same design, which has helped a lot. Uh, but honestly, the, the rake that I have that is most useful is the um, the Pullman's two which I built and two which Matt built because any steam loco that isn't Great West, even the pocket rocket looks shunting them. Uh, it's it's so it's difficult these days. I prefer to go for I have a locomotive. Do I have stock for it? No. Right, I will build some coaches. I've got. A hall, a Great Western Railway hall underway. 
and then I will modify my uh, monster design. Most big four coaches were quite similar, uh, at least from Lego point. Um, so I will then convert my monster design to have slightly lower wind and to have uh, chocolate and When I finally get around to building a southern loco, I'll build some more actual monster. Uh, I, I've kind of locked upon a sort of coach design that can be used for most. It's, it's just a case of designing coaches with liveries in mind and designing them to fit the stock you've already because <laughs> trying to make a generic one doesn't work. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything about rolling stock and matching liveries and time errors i think stuart posted something in the chat which might be might be relevant he has interchangeable liveries on his carriages yeah and it was easier because the the, the model i did it for was the narrow sided uh hasting stock so actually it's neat that i have model seven wide but i've got some six wide stock which is legit it's all um studs straight up yeah so literally the sides just switch out and I can switch the blue and gray sides and just switch in network southeast sides onto it. And it takes me about 10 minutes to switch the sides in. So when there was a network southeast exhibition, I was able to kind of offer a uh, network southeast trailer and a carriage that suddenly gave me like 15 years shift in the period that I model Romsey layout for. Um, just switch out the black uh, lamp posts on the platforms for red lamp posts jobs are good and anybody anybody knows the kind of the big repaint that network southeast did of, of all the stations in the you know late 80s and early 90s um it's amazing what a few t- tweaks and some switchable liveries on rolling stock can do for extending the period range of your layout one thing i can add to that is uh, i think people generally tend to look at rolling stock that can, can go with a lot of different trains and get away with it i think pullmans are quite a good example of that there's not not many steam locos that don't look good pulling a rake of pullmans even if it's you can claim it's modeling a preservation train or whatever uh, so I'd, I'd say it's rare that you find people modeling very specific types of rolling stock to go with a particular engine we do have um pete neumann who's built a lovely rake of those um dutch livery wagons to go with his locos but we don't tend to find that very often Moving on, I think that fits quite nicely because um, I was going to bring Pete up in the next section, which was um, what is the weirdest locomotive prototype you've seen built in Lego? Um, and Pete certainly knows how to pick them. So he's built the VR class um, 13, which is a cow and calf um, 08, essentially built for Tinsley Yard to um, shunt things over a rather steep. Yeah, and I think this thing. is built one well. Yeah, this is built a very similar one there as well yeah um i think darren um i remember darren also builds some pretty pretty weird prototypes as well um mostly diesel um so if we pass that back to the guests first um sam what's the weirdest um lego locomotive prototype you've seen uh it's a tough one there are definitely some crazy ones out there i'm trying to attempt at least to do some weird ones. I've had a look at the BR GT3, which is the gas turbine engine, um, which is in that sort of disgusting brown livery with dark green wheels. <laughs> it's pretty funky. Um, can't think any weird example. Oh, actually, um, West Turngate's got quite a nice uh, NER electric engine. I'm not sure what the name of the prototype is, but it's sort of like a two bogey diesel with um, just a basic like mid cab layout to, you know, kind of crocodile fronts to it. Oh, you're talking about the, what, one of the northern, one of the electric locos? Yeah, yeah. I don't know the name, but I know the one he means. It's like, yeah. is it NE1 or something, uh, EE1 or something like that, and EN1 or something? The, the, yeah, there's a couple of designs. Yeah. The EE1 I'm trying to, <laughs> I've got going to. I think, so, um... like, I think I remember Dan. The um, what was the what's the loco you've posted in the chat? The photo of Matt. That's the uh, GT3. That's, that's the GT3. So I think I'm pretty sure um, Dan from Tech Brick has one of those built that he uses on his um, display at yeah, does. shows, doesn't he? That rings a bell. Yeah. 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 Someone definitely does because I was going to build one, but because someone else has already done one, I didn't bother. I've been I, I, I noticed. I noticed Sam's. Uh, I, was, I was just looking through Flickr earlier, and I happened to know I've always had a soft spot for that loco. It's what diesel should look like. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
Ooh. And it's got those cylinders, which oh, no, makes it's... it infinitely easier to build. Very strange looking, but it's it quite is. nice. I, I love it. Amazing. I think it's amazing. I think it's a damn shame it got destroyed. Yeah, it is actually. They should invest it in it. Maybe, maybe I think it was promising. Maybe I could talk to the P, uh, the A1, P2 mob and say, instead of building a B, whatever it is you build, build GT3. <laughs> build something that isn't garbage, yeah. No, they're not going to build a Gronk. Oh. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need any more Gronk. There's over a hundred... Yeah, you alone have more than enough Gronk. <laughs> I've got another example of a um, pretty weird-looking loco I've seen on Twitter by um, a Japanese guy. I don't know if I can pronounce his prop- name properly. It's Yamatai, something like that. Oh, yeah. He's, I think he won something in the... Oh, the leader. Oh, uh, yeah. But he's um, designed a model of um, the bullied leader class, which is basically a steam uh, loco that's in the shape of a diesel. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Very strange. It's wet it's the best looking loco ever. That, um, that designer also posted some um, the IET Class 800 models as well um, in the same yeah in the same post. So he's oh, done good. an LNER, LNER livery and a Great Western Class 800 as well in dark green, which looks really smart. And he's I think it's quite a hard prototype to capture the nose of, and he's done a reasonable job of getting the curves in. Um, I'm tempted to ask him if um, he's got instructions I can use. Like being six wide, but the look in the R one is nice. It's it's the best looking eight hundred model I've seen. I've done in Lego. Yeah, it's it's a very hard model to capture. I think the only the only thing that does bother me is the tapering down on the bottom, um, because it it just looks a bit too narrow over the front wheels. But could probably live with that. We'll see what he says. Um, Stuart, do you have a particularly weird prototype that's I, built in Lego? No, that- I have nothing more to add after the person who mentioned GT3 wins this part of the uh, podcast. I think absolutely <laughs> plus one for that. It's just a shame that Trace is non because following on from Chocolate Brown, you know, another one that's a dead spot for the color match on, um, you know, the reddish brown. Fantastic. You know, who who knew he that? Does like his brown logo, doesn't he? Who, yeah, exactly. Who who knew that kind of LBSCR Umber and uh, GT3 would be bedfellows? You know, and kind of. You know, just making good use of that reddish brown thing. I just remembered one actually. Uh, a patron of mine, uh, Luke Trident, which I think I think he's a member of. He is, yeah, yes. LNR. Yeah. I think he's at work. He has built the uh, W1, which is uh, quite a bizarre one. Hush, hush. So that, that's definitely one I would consider to be a bit weird. Somebody else. It's called the hush, hush, but you're still all talking. Somebody about else it. has done a green one. Is designing a green one of them right now. I'm trying to. Make... Was it Lewis? No, I think Lewis, Lewis built some I don't weird think prototypes. Oh, it's, it's they, they are quite nice. You win something or other. Um, is it you in oh, you? yes. No, you out something, you, isn't it? Was, it? It, was on one, it was on one of our previous podcasts, I think. Ah, yes. So Andrew's posted a link to Luke's shush, which is um, yeah, a really unusual prototype, just a really weird shape, and I think Luke's captured it fairly well. Um, so we'll stick that in the chat. All I can offer f- personally is my uh, little Wickham trolley, which I particularly wanted to try and build. So kind of, that's my it's most unusual quite, one. Pete's well, got a nice one of those as well. Completely actually, having perfect. seen that, um, ha- having seen that really small motor that somebody had attached to a, I think it was a Hogwarts Express in one of the Facebook Lego train groups. Um, potentially, you could power the um, yeah. Wickham trolley. Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> you can do all the hard work, Stuart, and we'll take credit for that one. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> See you in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's probably when shows are going to happen again. So, quite possibly. I love your optimism. Oh yes, there's a green hush hush as well. So, was yeah, that what was the Australian guy whose name I have no idea how to pronounce? Ah, uh, now I know who you're talking about now. God, yeah. I you his name something like Let's Mr. Wagga Wagga. Or just, just a real town name. A couple of nice. It's good. Huge, though. I mean, I think a couple of nice. really nice like, British locos now. Difficult shape to capture. Yeah. Okay, do we have any more weird um, Lego locomotive I've built types? a few unusual locomotives. Go on, then. Uh, <laughs> there's the, the Glasgow subway trains I've done. Mm, they are pretty they're weird. weird. I, we nearly managed to get Full podcast I mean, without those being mentioned. They're their own unique gauge for one. Um, I don't know what size it is. It's something like ridiculous, like twenty-two millimeter gauge or something. 
And anything else? Oh, um, you're, there's oh, your boots. The other one is the uh, smokeless, uh, smokeless, coalless Fire. steam engine I've made. Fireless. Boots number two. Fire. It's coalless. It has no coal in it. Shut your face. Yes, but the cold. <laughs> Fireless. <laughs> Amongst the things it doesn't have, coal, fire. <laughs> it definitely has smoke. It's, uh, but yeah, it like all proper steam engines, it only uses steam and nothing. I, 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 I think, think that was a local, that was the loco of the podcast a few podcasts back, wasn't it? it? I think it was like number two or number three. When we still that long did ago, that. God. <laughs> yep. I um, feel like we've all missed one important, unusual loco, and that's Isaac Smith's combination um, Ivor and small hand grenade. Uh, he's done a beautiful little uh, Ivor locomotive, which uh, if you run it fast enough on a railway, will fly off and explode. <laughs> <laughs> As he discovered himself after being told by me. All, all locomotives do that if you drive them fast enough. Oh no, but this or one's... Someone's ass knocks them off. This one is literally, it, it's like a tiny green hand grenade. The only things that stayed together were the bits that had uh, uh, tape on them. <laughs> It sounds like a combination of trains and the robot wars session at the end of the steam shows that we have. But... <laughs> <laughs> you, we should, we should that next time. <laughs> yeah. It's got to be. Uh, Isaac, Isaac has another unusual prototype that we always forget, and that's Tom. Oh, Tom, you mean? Are you, are you mean the one that yeah. was designed to blow up? <laughs> <laughs> it, it did get jettisoned against the wall, yes. <laughs> Wait. I think it, was it an April Fool's? episode yeah probably. yeah that's pretty funny surely we should talk about <laughs> andrew's experiments with flying trains as well then oh you mean the one where i, fl- I chucked the train out of an upstairs window it was the back to the, the loco that they used in back to the future wasn't it yeah so um oh, no. back to the future three climaxes with a, this massive loco falling into a ravine off a wooden trestle bridge so I re- recreated that with Lego and basically built this really simple version of it in eight wide just for the purpose of chucking out the window, smashing it to bits, <laughs> and then doing that multiple times. Yes, you do. <laughs> Did you damage any Lego in that attempt? I think there might have been a couple of plates that got kind of bent and <laughs> kinked and stuff, but nothing major. So I think um, that would be a potentially a good place to end the podcast um, on a crash, as usual. Um, so thanks to our members, Matt, who's been producing, Andrew, who's been acting as the podcast winner and also speaking and contributing, uh, Will, Trace, Chris, Hello. Uh, our guests, Sam and Stuart as well. Thank you. Cheers. And uh, thanks, thanks uh, guys, for coming along and talking to us this afternoon. Or Well, I think Sam, is. it's probably now about 1 a.m. Early 1 o'clock. Nearly. And uh, for Trace, it would have been about 9 a.m., I think. So we're, we're nice and spread out for this one. Um, so thanks again for listening. We'll be back with another podcast, I presume, uh, in 2021, because this is the last recording of 2020. Um, give us a like on no, Twitter, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter on Instagram, podcast. and we'll see you soon. Not at the current rate that Matt is editing, no. I don't, I don't think he needs any more work. We could bring it out for next Christmas. We, we, could, just record, <laughs> uh, we could just record Chris going, Gronk bar, humbug, Gronk bar, humbug, Gronk bar, humbug, for like gronk, half gronk, an gronk, hour. Gronk, 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 There's the Christmas special, bro. Yeah. The LMUR choir special. It's <laughs> <laughs> not a choir special. Very special. <laughs> LMUR carols. Yeah, we missed the APT. Jamie will be annoyed. Ah, nobody cares.